We get lax. We know things that we don't do sometimes. And we do things that we shouldn't do sometimes because we get lax. But it's time to tighten up in the spirit because uh, these are serious days and God is doing a a solemn work, and we need to be a part of it. Let me ask you a question. Why is the word prophet used so, so few times in the New Testament? The word prophet, you don't see it very much in the New Testament like you do in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, there is only one man that I know of well, two count Jesus, because they said, we perceive that you're a prophet. Of course, he was so much more than a prophet. But there's only one other man other than Jesus in the New Testament that was actually called a prophet. Anybody know who that is? Elijah. John, John the Baptist. Baptist. Huh? John the Baptist. No. Elijah. Elijah. No. Elijah. Well... I one mean, Caiaphas, that's for sure. Are made, I'm talking about in the this guy lived in the New Testament. Oh. They made uh, references to prophets of in the Old Testament. You know, of the Old Testament, they talked about them. But I'm talking about in the New Testament, a prophet in the New Testament in that era. The only one that I know of is Agabus, who came down. The Bible says he came down and talked. Uh, gave them a word from the Lord, the, the, some of the disciples that gave them a word from the Lord. So why is the New Testament not talking about the prophet this and the prophet that and the prophet this and the prophet, you know, like in the Old Testament, you know, and the word of the Lord came to Isaiah the prophet or Jeremiah the prophet or Micah the prophet or, or Samuel the prophet or, you know, I mean, you know, the Old Testament's full of it. So, why is that not the case in the New Testament? Does anybody have a... That's because Christ came to Jesus. There are unknown. Disciples. Say it again. Apostles. And uh, apostles. Now they're in the New Testament and most of all apostles and um, disciples go out there. You know. So you're saying that the prophets were other offices in the church uh, that, that, because there were so many other offices in the church. Yeah. I think that's part of it, sure enough. But, um, did you have your hand up? Yes. Because God made a way for all of us to hear from him. God made a way for all of us to hear from him, not just I like the prophets. That is hitting the nail on the it's head. It's <laughs> In the New Testament, we have Pentecost. And in Pentecost, the same spirit that was coming on all of those Old Testament prophets was poured out on all flesh. And actually, everybody that's in the kingdom of God ought to be prophetic. Now, I realize that there is still the office of the prophet. In the New Testament, you you got the fivefold ministry. You got the apostle, the prophet, the uh, uh, evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. The fivefold ministry, and that's a New Testament thing. Jesus gave those ministries to the church, but you don't hear much about a prophet being singled out like you do in the Old Testament because Pentecost. When the Spirit was poured out, that meant that God touched the mouth of every believer. And our words are to carry weight and authority and power and anointing. So, when I say you can order your world with your words, I'm not just playing. That's absolutely true. What happened at Pentecost? The Spirit of God spoke through flesh. Right? Isn't that what a prophet was in the Old Testament? 
the Spirit of God came upon a, a some flesh, some flesh and blood guy, and he be, he spoke as a prophet and became known as a as a prophet. The Bible says holy men of old were moved upon by the Spirit of God and they wrote under the anointing. That's why we have this Bible. So, in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, he became available to mankind, which was God's intention from the garden. All of Adam's descendants were supposed to have that kind of presence of the Spirit of God. That's what God breathed into Adam. The Spirit. Adam was Pentecostal. <laughs> so what I'm saying is. That. This. Is something that. In this generation. In the end of the end times. We need to. Understand. And access. And function in it. Because it's here for us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What power? The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost power, okay. No. No. <laughs> and yes. Yes and no. The power, of course, was facilitated by the Holy Ghost coming upon you. But what was the power? The power was in your words. That's what the Holy Ghost did first thing when he got here. Touched people's mouth and they began to speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit of heaven. So that was the power. God put the authority back in our mouths. Yes. We haven't used it. We haven't even recognized it. But I want to tell you, we're coming to a time where it is going to be key to the binding and loosing, to the understanding, to the revelation, to to what God is doing in the earth to establish his kingdom. It's becoming more and more important for us to understand this. Now, in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus anointed his disciples because he was, uh, he was finished. He was, uh, his work had been done. Uh, he was actually resurrected. Dead, buried, resurrected, and on his way back to the Father. And he calls his disciples together and said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and baptize them. And, then, and he said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. That was one of the signs. They shall speak with new tongue. Now, the word new is kainos in the Greek. It doesn't mean other tongues necessarily. It can mean other tongues. But it means a renewed or restored or resurrected tongue. Jesus came and paid the price as the last Adam to restore what the first Adam had and lost. And, and when the Holy Spirit came, he, Jesus bought it and the Holy Spirit brought it. How's that saying go? I made this up several years ago. Let's see. God thought it. Jesus bought it. The Holy Ghost brought it. The disciples taught it, and I sought it till I caught it. <laughs> Pretty good. You think I can't say that again? I think I will say it again. God thought it. Jesus bought it. The Holy Ghost brought it. The 
disciples taught it, and I sought it till I caught it. <laughs> So, what the Holy Spirit did was act on the finished work of Jesus Christ and everything that he purchased and he brought it in himself on the day of Pentecost and it was released back into mankind. You see that? Mm -hmm. The Old Testament was, was not God's program. It was not his plan. It wasn't his original plan. It was the, the, uh, the uh, scenic route taking us back to the garden. Uh, it was the Old Testament law which was never God's intention. It, it became necessary but it was not God's original intention. You understand that? So it was when God filled Adam with life it was spiritual life that ignited his physical life. Without spirit, your body is dead. It's the spirit that gives life. Jesus said, flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. So, when the Holy Spirit came, he brought life back to humanity and put power back in man's mouth. Now, we can have it if we access it and we uh, uh, appropriate it in our lives as God has directed us to in his word. So every, everybody's a candidate for this. Now, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And what he gave, what he purchased back, was a resurrected tongue, a resurrected mouth. New tongues, they shall speak with new resurrected tongues. Okay? Now then, that's why I say you can order your world with your words. Now, Jesus in 10.10 10 of John says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In other words, I have come to give you abundance of life. How are you going to do that, Jesus? He bought it. He paid for it. He resurrected to enforce it. And he sent his spirit and brought it to you. Delivered. He delivered it to you. That's service. So it is yours, it is mine, it is ours. We live far beneath our privilege as a general rule because we don't do what we know. Now, Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and they are life. Most people just speak words of flesh and death. Because the law of sin and death lives where the flesh lives. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus lives where the Holy Ghost is. You understand that? So if the spirit of God is in you, he is the spirit of life. Now then, Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. He was the last Adam. Adam's words were spirit and life. But my Bible says that the first Adam was made a living soul. And the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. See, Jesus took it and raised it to a new level. We're not as good as Adam was. We are better. We are the new creation in Christ Jesus. It is as though God started all over and did it better. 
I think we were supposed to develop to this through Adam. But since we, uh, in Adam, messed up, and God has now cut to the chase. And he let the last Adam, Jesus Christ, do the hard part for you and for me. Wow. Boy, we, do we owe him a debt of gratitude. Amen. What's the song say? I owed a debt I could not pay, and he paid a debt he did not owe. Yeah. Okay. So it is the spirit that quickens, and Jesus said, My words are spirit and life. So Jesus said, My words have life in them. Spiritual life. My words are powerful. And, and you say, well, that was because he's the son of God. No, not at all. It was because he was the spirit-filled last Adam. He was the son of God. But he laid that down to become man. So that he could suffer death for us. He never ceased to be the Son of God except for one brief period of time. And that was when he became sin for us. He was not the Son of the Father for those few hours. He was just a man. That's why he called from the cross, my God, my God. He didn't say, my Father, my... He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in the midst of hell, where he had been incarcerated for our sins, the Spirit of the Lord quickened him, gave him life there. See, Jesus died spiritually. Somebody, that, people don't... They get religious and they go, oh no, he didn't. He didn't go to hell. He didn't die. Absolutely he did. So you wouldn't have to. You better be glad he did or you would. <laughs> and the Spirit of God quickened him in hell. And the Bible says in the book of Acts that God said on that day, this day have I begotten thee. Jesus was born again. He was the first one that was ever born again. And on the day of Pentecost, all the disciples got born again by the Spirit. Somebody said, well, I thought they got filled with the Spirit. Yeah, but nobody had been born again except Jesus until that time. Jesus said, John is a great man. There's none greater, not even Moses, none. But even the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Why? Because John was not born again. He was not spiritually born again. Do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is now. <laughs> but he wasn't then. Yes, sir. But then Jesus said he got the Holy Ghost while he was in the womb. Is that same John? When, when he, when he yes, but the price had not been paid for his salvation yet because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross and died and paid the price. So it was the Spirit of God in John, just like it was the Spirit of God in the Old Testament upon the prophet, but he was not filled with the Spirit. He was just activated by the Spirit. Those Old Testament prophets, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon them. And then later he'd come upon them again. And then later he would come upon them again. When he came on Pentecost, he came to stay. See the difference? Now then, but that's a good thought. You're thinking, I like that. I like that. That's a good question. Now, in Job, chapter 33, verse 5, Elihu, who is that fourth friend of Job. You got the three friends that came, and they sat and commiserated with Job, and blamed Job and called him a sinner and a failure and all that and wanted to know why he had done something to offend God and, and bring all them, this stuff, stuff on himself. And, and uh, uh, you know, they were miserable friends.
friends. I don't even know why they were called friends. I guess they were friends before he went through the trial. We call them Karens now. <laughs> we, call them what? we call them Karens now. Karens. You did it. <laughs> but the fourth one came, Elihu, who was representing the Spirit of God. I've taught this before, but you may not remember it. Elihu came, represent. he said, I am here. He was a young man. The others were old, about, you know, they were like Job. And he said, he said, I have been silent. I have kept, held my peace to listen to, to the eldership of, of, between you and, and, and these men. He said, but now I have to defend God. Or I have to say that things have been said about God that are not true. And I want to point them out to you. But here's, here's what he said. He starts out by saying to Job. Now re remember, he, he is representing the Spirit of God. I believe it, it, that it was the Spirit of God that came upon a man named Elihu. And he knew who he was. And he came and the Spirit spoke through him and said, Set thy words in order before me. Set thy words in order before me. In other words, if you're gonna if you're gonna have issues with God, Job, you better get your you better get your mouth straight. You better get your words in order because I'm about to speak truth to you, and you need to have your words in order. You've got to align your words with the truth. Or you're going, to, you're going to pay a price if you don't. That's what he was saying. But I want to take those words here. And I want to lift them to us today. Set thy words in order. That's what the Holy Ghost came to do. To set our words in order. Now, the word order has no chaos in it. It has no if, ands, buts, or maybes in it. It's the order of God. That means bring your words into alignment with truth, with God's word, which is truth. Do you see that? We just speak what we feel or what we think or, or, or what we want or whatever, you know, whatever the flesh dictates. That's what we most of the time say. But we need to learn to put our words in the order of God. That's where the power is. When we align our words with his words. There's no power in a confession of doubt and unbelief. There is power in a confession of truth. I hope you see this because this is very important. We've got to step up. And I'm not just talking about the people in this, in this Bible study. I'm talking about the people that are listening on CD or on uh, YouTube or on uh, uh, email, whatever. However it's getting out there. We have to step up. Now, in Hebrews chapter 3, or chapter 11, verse 3, the Bible says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, I want to back up, and as I have done a time or two in here, I want to show you something. I believe the translators put the comma in the wrong place in translating from the original manuscripts. I believe it should read like this. We understand that the worlds through faith were framed yeah. by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You just change through faith yeah, from the beginning to 
about the middle there, because God has faith in his own words. That's what this scripture is saying. God's faith in himself. He knows who he is. He knows the truth. And we understand that the worlds, didn't just say one world, said worlds. That means the heavenly world, the spiritual world, the, 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 the earth world, even in the regions of hell. Satan wouldn't have a place if God hadn't made it. Satan just twisted it, perverted it, but it belongs to the Lord. Even hell belongs to, to the Lord. But he didn't make it like it is. That's the devil's business. He did that. He twisted it. Now, we understand that the world's through faith, God's faith, were framed by the words of God so that things which are seen, everything tangible, were made by things which are not seen, things that don't appear. Words. Words can be heard, but they can't be seen unless you write them down. Right. You understand this? Yes. So that scripture is telling us that God framed the worlds with his word. And he had faith in his words. That's what made them work. God has confidence in himself. I mean, who else is going to have confidence in? There's none great. God... Where's God go for advice? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> now you can order your world with your words because the Spirit of God, same Spirit, God only has one Spirit. The Spirit of God that was upon Jesus, the Spirit of God that God breathed into Adam, the Spirit of God that came on the day of Pentecost, it's all the same Spirit. The Spirit of God that came upon the prophets in the Old Testament, that's the same Spirit. Different, different uh, uh, manifestations, different uh, uh, outpourings, different uh, operations, but same Spirit. You have the authority and the power and the anointing through the Holy Spirit to frame your world with your words. God framed His with His words. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can do it because you are in the likeness and image of God. Just as Adam was. You are in Christ. And you are heirs and joint heirs with him. This earth belongs to the Lord. He never relinquished it to the devil. He put it under the stewardship of Adam and Adam's sin. And it came under Satan's dominion. But Jesus came and got it back. He's not going to get it back. He already did. And it's our world because we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. And what he got, we got. This is God's world and we are stewards over this world. The devil's got no business even being here. It's not his. He has no right to it. And you have the authority and the Holy Ghost power to set him in his place. At least to set him out of your place. Amen. God made us, I believe, for this purpose. To help bring Satan down to his finality. That's what we're here for. So we need to get at it. We have been running from him when we ought to be running after him. Amen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 Now you can order your health. You can order your finances. You can order your emotions. You can order your world with your words. Your confession by the Spirit of God. By the authority of Jesus Christ in his name. The power of attorney of his name by the Spirit. Get to talking. Don't talk about these issues. Talk 
to them. Mm -hmm. Stand in the mirror and look at your sorry self. <laughs> and speak to you. And tell you. Way it's supposed to be according to the truth. Not what you feel. Not what you think. Not how bad it is, but what the truth about it is. And if you don't know, you go dig in your word till you find out. You got it in your lap. Here it is. Nobody going to do that for you. You got to do it yourself. I mean, I can point you in directions, but I can't do your studying and your praying. I can't do that. And I wouldn't if I could. <laughs> Mark eleven twenty three. Let's shuck it right on down to the cob. You ready? Yes. Jesus said unto them, Who? The disciples. The saints. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, Verily, verily, verity, verily, truly, I say unto you, that whosoever, that's you, shall say unto this mountain, not about it, unto it, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, not his head, his heart, but shall believe in his heart, that those things which he saith, shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Yeah. Now I can't make it any plainer than Mark did. Amen. Now get this straight. Have faith in God. Literally translated that says have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. It's not just saying, believe in God. No, it's saying, act like God. Yes. You see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have the faith of God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Heart. That's not the organ that beats in your chest. That's the middle of you. That's your spirit. Mm -hmm. Don't doubt what you say if you're saying the truth. Now, if you're talking a bunch of gibberish, you can doubt that. But when you say what God says, don't doubt it. Your brain may go tilt. I don't understand it. That's not logical. That's not reasonable. I, you, you know, doubt. Th this, th th this doesn't say that you might not have doubt in your thoughts. It says in your heart, where you, where you really live, in your heart. Don't you doubt there. There's a correlation between your heart and your mouth. Best statement I've made right now all day. Mm -hmm. He's talking about moving mountains here. Mountain moving. And he's not saying, pray and ask God to move it. He's saying you do it. Yeah. Jesus is the one saying this, y'all. Mm -hmm. He ought to know. Yeah. He spoke to fig trees and to fish. Yeah. He spoke to to, to storms. Yes. Spoke to the, he spoke to the dead gum ocean. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the wind. Yeah. Why? Yes. He's the rightful heir. The it's his. Mm -hmm. He's the steward over it. It's supposed to cooperate with him. And it's supposed to cooperate with you. But we talk about how bad it is and how awful it is and how, how uh, it, it's not uh, like it used to be and this and that and the other. Get your words in order. 
Somebody said, well, you just teaching a positive confession. Well, I ain't preaching a negative one. That's right. <laughs> and I'm not just preaching a positive con co uh, confession. I'm preaching confessing the truth. If it ain't the truth, don't let it come out of your mouth. Amen. 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 Okay, here we go. You must know who you are just like God knows who he is. Yes. You're in his image. Yes. you got to have confidence in your relationship with God. You know, my mom and dad were, I mean, they were, I couldn't have, couldn't have had a better mother and father. I am part and parcel of who they are. Their genes and chromosomes are in me. I don't doubt that. I know. And look, I, I know who they were. And because I know who they were, I know who I am. That's right. Amen. Same thing with my, my Heavenly Father. I know who He is. That makes me know who I am. Spiritually, I know who I am. And I've got confidence in my relationship with him. I am his child. I won't doubt that for a, for a millisecond. I'm his child. I'm in his likeness and in his image. Because that's what he made me to be. And I've been born again into it. I may not look like much. But I am. because, And I know who I am. I also know who I'm not. Right. Most, I won't say most, some preachers waste a lot of time trying to be somebody else. That's true. I learned a long time ago, I can't preach like that one or that one or this one over here and I can't teach like this one and that one. I just got to be me. I'm the only me. I'm the best me God's got. That's right. <laughs> And because I know who I am, I do what I do. Yes. So, when you have confidence in who you are in God, just as much as you do or more than you do who you are in the flesh by your earthly mom and dad, then that confidence gives you authority to act in his behalf and have used the power of attorney of his name. Yeah. Amen. And speak to some stuff. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because you are a rightful heir in this earth. Amen. You're not going to be when you get to heaven. You are today. Yeah. Amen. You are not going to be saved. You already are. Yeah. You're not going to be redeemed. You already yeah. are. You're not going to be a child of God. You're not going to have the victory. You already have those things. We're waiting to get to heaven to get some victory. Or to get some joy and some peace. My God, get it now. Now's when you need it. There's a lot of it going on up yonder. Now here's where you need it. Amen. Amen. Stop empowering your enemy. Stop empowering him. Well, how have I been empowering him? With your mouth. Listen, holy angels will not help you with a bad confession. But unholy spirits will. Okay, now, I think I need to say that again. Holy angels will not help you with a negative confession. But unholy spirits will. They'll see to it that it comes to pass for you. Well, I just don't feel like I'm able to do it. Put your hand right here and choke yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Bite your tongue. Yeah, that's right. Quit confessing your feelings. Mm -hmm. Confess the truth. Mm -hmm. 
because the truth will change your feelings. Your feelings are never going to change the truth. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Old Testament, but look to what God says. This book of the law. You got one right there in front of you. This book of He didn't have what you got. Boy, he wished he did have what you got. But he had the Old Testament Moses version. He had the Moses translation. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, you need to keep some word handy to, to say it. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night thou, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosper. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He didn't say God shall make your way prosper. He said, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. How's that going to happen? If he speaks the law of God and lets it come out of his mouth. Do you see that? Now, it says here, prosperous. Make, thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You can frame your world with your words every day. The word prosperous there means flourishing, thriving, successful, fruitful, healthy. We have a little tinge of some symptom. First thing we do is call. Because that's, that's how you've prioritized the way you think. The very first thing that we ought to do is take it to God. And we ought to find out what he says about it. Because he is the great physician. Mm -hmm. Remember that little lady in the, in the scripture that was internally bleeding? Yes. She had spent all of her money on doctors. There's a lot of people doing that today. Yes. And was nothing better. And not only was she not better, she was worse. So what, what was all that money spent for? What, what did it buy? It bought their Mercedes probably. That's right. <laughs> The medical profession these days, by and large, is not trying to get you well, cured. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's trying to maintain you. Mm -hmm. Give you prescriptions and help your symptoms yeah. as much as we can. We'll perform surgery on you and drain what little's left in your pocketbook and drain your insurance money as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then we can't guarantee anything yeah. because she might actually be worse after you have that back surgery than you were before you had it. But we'll try. Doctors practice. God's got it down. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Somebody says, practice makes perfect. No, it no. doesn't. Perfect practice makes perfect. There you go. Just practice don't make perfect. Flesh is not your solution. Your job is not your source. Your salary is not your source. God is your source. He is your doctor. He is your lawyer. He is your director and your guide. He is your father. He is all in all. All the fullness of God came in Jesus Christ and he gave it all to us. We have partaken of his fullness. I'm not saying that doctors are evil. Jesus had a doctor on his staff. But I noticed he never went to him for advice. Luke, what would you do in a case like this? Luke, what kind of medicine we got for this? 
because they're not the enemy, or at least they're not supposed to be, unless they get weaponized right. against us by the enemy. And that has happened some. Yes, mm -hmm. a lot, actually. But I want to tell you, you are more in charge of your life than anybody else is. That's right. And you control your own destiny. In Christ Jesus with your confession. Yes. What you say is what you get. Yes, that's right. What you say. You know, and I listen to Christians sometimes. I don't say anything, but I listen to what Christians say. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, 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 a spew of, oh, I'm hurting here and I'm hurting there. Oh. And this is not good. Oh, and the doctor says, oh. And I want to tell you, it's never been this bad. Oh, and I didn't. Amen. You have what you say. You just keep talking about it. Go on, and it'll perpetuate in your life. That's right. Amen. For God's sake and for your sake, go to the Word of God and find the confession that you need to be making over your health and over your finances and over your life. I'm not mad at anybody. Well, let me rephrase it. I'm mad at the devil. I'm not mad at you. I love you. Amen. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't take the time to be prepared to tell you the truth every week. Amen. James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to read this to you from the Message Bible Translation. James 3, 5 and 6. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled 